There isn't a soul in the world I can talk about this with. I don't know if I need advice, a pep talk, or what. I use my main account for memes and other BS. But I made this throwaway because I'm going mad trying to cope. Life has pushed me to the edge, and I'm struggling to find my integrity. Yet I question what are actually the righteous things to do, say, and think. I guess to begin, I need to explain that I'm typing this in a hospital room. Yesterday at about 7.30 a.m., my wife and I were involved in a wreck. I came out with only a few cuts and bruises. Mari, my wife, suffered a crushed shoulder, broken collarbone, three broken ribs, and a collapsed lung. They expect her to fully recover, but for now, they have her heavily sedated. Having to type this out on a phone is a daunting task. But at the moment, I have the time to post here, even if I'm not sure I have the will to do it. I wouldn't be posting in this subreddit if things were perfect with our marriage, obviously. I just could never imagine my wife being unfaithful in any way. My heart is broken. I feel incomplete, like part of me is missing. And saddest of all, that part is sitting a mere three feet away from me. I had felt us growing apart over the last three months, but I couldn't come up with a reason why. We are both 34. Mari and I have known each other since we were children. We began dating in high school and all the way through college. She is the only woman I have ever done anything of a physical nature with. Up until recently, she could say the same. We married a year after college and had our first child, Michael, a year later. Three years after my son was born, Carrie, our daughter, began a life of me trying to spoil her rotten. I love my kids more than life itself. If not for them, I'm not sure I would be here right now. They were not involved in the wreck, thank God. They were spending the night at my parents. We were due to fly down to Florida for a cruise yesterday afternoon. Obviously, that is all canceled, but my wife decided to go out with her best friend, even though I urged her to get home and not drive around in the snow. She swore she and her best friend Rebecca were just going to have a few drinks since they wouldn't see each other for a week. I went to bed and slept like a baby until about 5 a.m. I got up and looked out the window to see my wife's car was not out front, but we'd gotten several more inches of snow. I assumed Mari and Becca got a little too drunk and crashed at her place. I threw some clothes on and got into my SUV. Before I left, I texted Mari to tell her not to drive, that the snow was too deep, and I was coming to get her. It remained unread. I cannot guess how many times I have wondered what would have happened if she had read that text. I'd still be living a lie. I'd still have a gut feeling. But I wouldn't be in the utter misery I now find myself. I got to Becca's and pulled up in front of her condo. I looked at the message again, and it still had not been read. I had actually hoped Mari would read it and be ready when I arrived. But I resigned myself to the fact I'd have to go in and wake her. The front door was unlocked, so I walked in and looked to the TV room to my right. There was nobody passing out on the sofa. Rebecca's bedroom was downstairs, and I didn't want to wake her. So I took the stairs up to her guest room and opened the door. Then my life ended. I remember walking into the room and seeing two heads peeking out from the covers. I remember leaning down to pull the comforter towards me. I even remember seeing my wife laying her head on some guy's shirtless chest. The next thing I remember was Becca, Mari, and some half-naked guy I'd never seen trying to pull me off of him. I'd probably be in jail right now, if they hadn't. But I honestly don't remember a damn thing. So, right or wrong, I don't really feel too bad about that. My wife, on the other hand, well, that changes from minute to minute these days. When I came to my senses, the dude said he'd take his buddy to the hospital. Mari bawled her eyes out while Rebecca and I screamed it out. I told her and my wife I was leaving and she had five minutes to be in my car or to not bother coming home. She was there in three. It's really not a good idea to be angry driving in snow, even with four-wheel drive. But it was another vehicle that veered into our lane and forced us through a guardrail. That's what caused Mari's injuries. The car rolled, thank God for airbags, but we lived. The kids don't even know we had a wreck. I haven't called anyone. I probably should have. But this wasn't just a wreck. My life has been wrecked and I'm trying to gauge the damage before I start bringing others into the situation. I'm numb 
and yet I hurt like hell, and not from the wreck. I feel like, I don't even know the person laying in that hospital bed. I want to ask her so many damn questions, but I really don't want to know any of the answers. She obviously no longer loves me. No one with a soul could cheat on someone they love. So I have to ask if she ever loved me. And now that she has cheated, would I ever want her to love me again if that were possible? I don't know the specifics of when she first cheated, but in my book, the instant she did, our marriage ended. The vows were broken. She ended our marriage, and we're no longer man and wife. I don't need a divorce attorney to nullify my marriage. She's already done that. Therefore, I am no longer under obligation to the vows I gave. A huge part of me wants to just walk out of this room. I want to call her parents, tell them what she did and what happened, and then let them know she is their problem again after all these years. We said for better or for worse, and I meant it, but we are no longer married. Part of me wants to leave her a note and tell her that two bad things happened to come after she ended our relationship. The only thing that is keeping me in this damn room is my children. I want to see them so badly right now, but I have some scratches on my face and neck. They would know something happened if they saw me. As much as I feel my wife has defiled herself and our family, my kids need her. I thought I had a life partner. And as horrible as she ended up being, my children need a mom in their life. There are going to be talks that I am not qualified to have and wouldn't know where to begin. There are going to be injuries that need kisses instead of being told to walk it off. I'm a damn good father, but I can't be a mother too. Please someone help me. How can I sit here and look over someone who has stabbed me in the back so cruelly? Should I call her parents to come? What do I tell them? I really don't want to be here. Here, especially with her parents, if I don't tell them what she did, they are going to know I'm angry. What in God's name do I tell my children? Yeah, I can tell them we were in a wreck, but I'm not the kind who can fake emotions. Obviously, my wife does it with ease, but when I loathe someone it shows on my face, they will know I am angry at their mother. How the hell did my life come to this? I already know I need to see a lawyer. I figured that much out, but how do I handle this? It took so long to get approved that I didn't think my post had been posted. I just started getting notifications, so I am sorry for not responding sooner to people who made comments trying to help. Update. For whatever reason, I could not respond to questions from my first post. It may have something to do with this being a throwaway account. But I could reply to comments, but nobody could see the replies except me. I tried posting this update in the infidelity sub last night, but had issues. Hopefully the same glitch doesn't happen with this update, and I can give feedback for others to better assist me. My apologies to anyone who did leave a response. It was appreciated and helpful. After my initial post that day, I decided to stay one more night in that hospital room. With Mari sedated and the lights out, I laid back in the recliner, looking at the ceiling, listening to the medical machines. I laid there wondering how the hell my life had reached that point. Part of me felt like I was giving her undeserved mercy just by being in the same room. Yet part of me loved her. I didn't want to feel that love. I actually felt weak for having any positive feelings for her. Over and over in my mind I kept realizing there was no fixing things back to the way they were. It was as if some natural disaster had taken the life we built and destroyed it. I cried. I cried so damn hard. I realized a huge part of my life was over. That was a moment of huge significance in my life. When the nurse came into the room to take blood the next morning, I excused myself. When Mari woke up, she saw me heading out the door and called to me, but I acted like I didn't hear her. I went and got some breakfast. I haven't had much of an appetite since finding out. I tried to kill some time eating and scanning through my phone. There was a text from Becca asking where Mari was that I left unread. I decided at 7 a.m. it was late enough to knock on her parents' door. Her dad was always an early riser. I planned to talk to him first, and if he thought his wife needed to hear it, he could wake her. I saw smoke coming from the wood stove in his workshop out back, so I knocked on the door before entering. He saw the scratches on my neck and bruises on my cheek. I explained there had been an accident, Mari had gotten the worst of it, but we needed to talk. I think. He assumed I meant about the accident, 
So he woke my mother-in-law to hear what I had to say. We sat in the kitchen as I explained how going around a curved car in the oncoming lane veered into our lane. Having the heavier vehicle and all-wheel drive, I managed to keep us on the road until we hit the guardrail. The passenger side door caught one of the vertical I-beams mounted in concrete. Even with side airbags, Mari hit hard. She sustained lots of injuries, but I told them she was stable and they expected a full recovery. They both cried, knowing their daughter had suffered, but would still be around for them to love. As soon as they insinuated they would be around to help me in any way they needed to assist me in looking after Mari. That was when I stopped them and explained, the wreck wasn't what I had come to tell them. They looked confused as I explained waking up that morning and sending a text to head off in the snow to make sure my wife was okay. I told them about walking in on their daughter and some guy I had never seen, and unconsciously beating him over and over. They were both shocked. Then I told them what room she was in at the hospital, and explained that I always wanted them to be a part of the kids' lives. So I hoped they could remain friendly with me. I told them my dad was looking after them at the moment, but I was divorcing their daughter. Because she had broken our vows and was no longer my wife, I was leaving their place and driving to my dad's to tell the kids about the wreck. I was also going to tell them that we were splitting up and wouldn't be together anymore. I wasn't going to tell them that their mother was a cheater. I told my former in-laws that, while I hated that things had to end the way they did, at least I could say I wasn't the one who destroyed our marriage and my life. They tried to tell me I shouldn't be so hasty that she made a mistake and gave the usual lame excuses. I just smiled and told them I had loved having them as in-laws over the years and walked out. When I got to my dad's, I of course had so much I needed to get off my chest. I entered through the kitchen, where I found my dad having a cup of coffee. The only thing he knew was that I was supposed to be on a big boat in the Caribbean. He stood and asked what I was doing there. I just grabbed him, hugged him and cried like a child. It was the kind of thing where he really wanted to know what was going on, but sensed he needed to let me cry it out before prying. He led me to the den and sat me on the couch to go get my mom. We both urged her to have a cup of coffee first, but she knew if I was there alone that early I had something bad to tell them. I first explained about Mari cheating, me catching her, and leaving Becca's. Then I explained about the wreck that it was pretty bad. I told them about Mari's injuries and explained that I had let her parents know only an hour before so they could go see her. Both of my parents were stunned. My mom finally asked me what I was going to do. They both cried when I told them my only remaining option was to divorce Mari and be the best father I could for my children. As our conversation was winding down, I heard my daughter Carrie squeal daddy and come running down the stairs toward me. That woke up my son who was also downstairs for a few minutes. I hadn't seen them in so long, I just spent time hugging them, happy to see them. It took a while for them to notice my scratches. I told them about the wreck and that their mommy was in the hospital, but going to be fine. I told them Mari's parents would eventually pick them up to take them to see their mom and left it at that. I spent a day playing, talking to, holding, napping with, and laughing with my children, and those two made me want to live again. Until that point, if I'm honest, I was like 50-50 about wanting to go on, but they are worth living for, protecting, and cherishing. My wife's phone was destroyed in the wreck, so nobody had gotten a response for days. Early that night, I started getting texts from my mother-in-law's phone, and knew they had to be from Mari. I ignored them. They continued sporadically off and on through the night, so I turned off notifications. The next day, I spoke with three law officers about filing for divorce. I can't say I want or even need a legal divorce, but it will divide assets and determine custody of our children children, what she does with who is no longer of any concern to me. I have met with two lawyers, and I prefer the second one. I will also meet with the third rated lawyer to see if he impresses me, if not, I will go with the top divorce attorney from the second firm. Either way I will have removed three top legal options from her list of candidates, and that is a win for me. Custody is my primary focus. I am not seeking full custody, and I wouldn't want it, even if I could get it. 
The children need their mother in their lives, but because of what she did, she can never be a part of my life again. A go-between can drop the kids off on time whenever and wherever they need to be. There is no reason for me to ever speak to her again. I never really knew her, so why would I continue to interact with a stranger? I will be returning to work next week, which would have been our cruise. I did not tell anyone at work that we did not go or anything about the accident. And, of course, they will see me driving a rental car and may question if I got a new car. I am not sure if I need to explain things to HR, but I do not want my personal business to be made public. I already feel humiliated and I do not want any more news to leak out. Divorce is sometimes necessary, but it always represents a failure. I am done being an anchor for a ship that has already sunk. And for those who rightly insisted on getting checked for STDs, I have had a full screening. Thank God, everything came back clean. Even that was enough to make me feel like some trench coat pervert, even though I did nothing wrong. I assume that by now, Mari has left the hospital. Her parents did not even try to bring her to the house. They could not have contacted me anyway because I was not reading Mari's constant texts. As soon as I can file for divorce and have her served, I can finally be done with the biggest mistake of my life. Her actions have invalidated all the time we spent together. If I had to do it all over again, I would not choose her. I would choose a life with someone else, anyone else who would actually be faithful and loyal. Her greatest asset, the ability to be trusted, is what she intentionally threw away. From having someone to call my own to being all alone, that is what I will miss. But I know that it was all a lie, and I meant nothing to her. People will fall for a beautiful lie and reject an ugly truth. But I am not one of those people. Many wanted to know the dirty details of who my wife cheated with, why, and for how long. I am sorry, but I do not have that information to share. And honestly, I do not want to know. Unless someone literally puts a gun to your head, there is no excuse for cheating. And beyond that, when you have made a lifelong commitment and sworn to uphold it, the decision to ruin it for the other person is vile. I wish I had never met her and had taken a chance on someone else, anyone else. She had no right to give me a life and then take it all away against my will. The man I was before her betrayal will never exist again, and the woman she pretended to be never existed. The life I had is now a facade and ruins that nobody wants to live in. As for an update, I am not sure where to begin or even what to say when I do. I suppose the first thing is to tell everyone that I have managed to get a very good lawyer. Uh, her firm is highly rated for representing men in divorce cases in my area. Instead of passing my case off to someone else on the legal team, she has taken it on herself. Nadia took on my case as her own. Everyone at the firm has been kind and supportive. I can tell they don't just care about getting their retainer and pay off. My lawyer Nadia has done everything she can to help me with my well-being and sanity. After agreeing to take my case, we went over the usual forms I needed to fill out. I listed my property and all bank account information, as well as ballpark estimates of our income. After explaining about the car accident and what I saw just before it happened, she asked if I had undergone an STD panel. I explained that I had and everything had come back clean. She then asked if I had documented the infidelity with pictures or video. I told her I hadn't been thinking rationally enough at the moment to do that. She contacted a private investigator from her firm and set up a meeting between him and me the next day. I live in an at-fault state, so while I knew my spouse was unfaithful, I needed actual evidence for the divorce to go in my favor. We arranged for one of her staff members to be the go-between for me and my spouse's father for communication and drop-offs. I asked her to notify my soon-to-be ex-father-in-law that my ex could have the kids for the upcoming weekend and following week. Nadia then asked if I had arranged therapy for myself and my children. I explained that I was due to have my first therapy appointment that week, but as the children had yet to be told anything, I was holding off on that. She told me to let her know as soon as I felt they were in need of any professional attention, as she had several therapists she could recommend. She expressed sincere condolences for all that I have been through and will go through. I usually dislike lawyers, but I think I may have found one with an actual soul. 
She gave me a list of things to collect and do before our next meeting, many of which were identical to the advice given by users on this forum. When she told me to stop by the drugstore to get two DNA kits, I thought nothing of it, as I knew it was standard protocol. When I got home with the kids that night, I did the cheek swabs for myself and them. I sealed everything up and mailed the kits off after taking the kids to school the next morning. Two days later on Friday, the go-between dropped the kids off with their grandfather for the weekend. That morning I went to work and was just coming back from lunch when I received an email notification from my personal account. I could see that it was two emails from the lab, so I waited to get to my computer to view them. At my desk, I opened the first email and clicked the link. The results confirmed that my son Michael is in fact my biological son. I opened the other email and clicked the link. I read what it said and then read it again. I couldn't really say anything, I just started shaking my head. I knew I had to get out of the office before breaking down, but I managed to take screenshots of both results and email them to myself as photo files. I went to my car and began crying as the realization that my daughter Carrie was not my biological daughter set in. I can't imagine that losing an arm would hurt, would hurt much more than losing a daughter. It honestly felt like my soul had been taken from me. I didn't know who to call. I just sat there crying and wishing I could wake up from this nightmare. I downloaded the two files from my email account and texted the pictures to my lawyer. Within 20 seconds, Nadia called and asked where I was. All I could manage to say was that I was at work. She told me to stay there and that someone from the firm would be there in a few minutes. I ended the call and opened the door. I began to vomit uncontrollably until I was dry heaving. By the time I managed to stop puking and feeling dizzy, one of the paralegals arrived to pick me up. She took me to the firm, and as soon as Nadia finished with the client, they ushered me into her office. The first thing she told me was that sometimes the tests come back wrong. She said she understood I was upset and had every right to be. But she urged me to get tested again with Carrie at a local lab to ensure there was no contamination. I couldn't believe what was happening. Even after catching Mari cheating, I just assumed the DNA test on the kids was a formality. I would have never thought my wife would ever be unfaithful. But imagining she was capable of having another man's baby, if true, who in the hell did I marry? I couldn't even confront Mari if I wanted to. I didn't have concrete proof. Yet, I couldn't imagine how she and I would ever have that conversation if the results confirmed our suspicions. One of the ladies in the office at the firm had a blood pressure cuff and checked mine to make sure it wasn't at dangerous levels was elevated and I felt like I was close to having a panic attack. Yet I was numb and in shock at the same time. I wondered what was next. I struggled to grasp that my little girl might not actually be my daughter. At that moment, I was grateful that the kids were staying with their mom. I started wondering if both test results could be wrong and if Carrie was my daughter and Michael wasn't my son. I knew I couldn't wait two days to know the truth. So, the intermediary set up a time for Carrie to be picked up the next day for a few hours and taken back to Mari's parents. We did the test in a sterile environment and with trained medical staff. There was no mix-up. I am not Carrie's father. It still took a day to get the results, and she was back with her mom by the time I received them. But I cried even harder the second time, and I'm grateful that Carrie wasn't there to witness it. I sent the results to my lawyer and she called to check on me. She urged me to seek out family and not go through this alone. I got into my car and drove to my dad's, crying the whole way. When I got there and saw my mom, she knew something was wrong. But I couldn't bring myself to tell her. Finally, I just managed to say Carrie is not my daughter. My mom asked me what happened, but she knew she heard correctly, and I couldn't repeat it. After about 30 seconds of silence other than me weeping uncontrollably, she stood up and got her cell phone. She called my dad and told him to hurry home, but to be careful because I had bad news. I could tell my dad wanted at least a hint at what could be so bad, but my mom just urged him to be safe and get home as soon as he could. He arrived in about 20 minutes and we all just cried for hours. 
I'd console my dad, he'd console my mom, and they'd console me. But we were all inconsolable. They asked me about Michael, and I assured them he was my son. They both expressed relief, but then felt guilty for being relieved to only be losing one grandchild. They asked me what I was going to do, and I told them I didn't know. The only thing that was certain for me at that moment was that Carrie would never want for anything she needed and most things she wanted. I didn't even care about potential child support at that moment, I just wanted to make sure she was taken care of. As horrible as I was feeling for myself, I felt even worse for Carrie, who was completely innocent. Did I want custody of her? Could I even get custody of Carrie if I wanted it? I began to wonder if Mari knew or suspected anything. I suddenly wanted some answers. After work on Monday, I met with Nadia, and she informed me that she had met with the private detective who was hired to follow Mari. Due to the car accident, Mari had not been able to leave the house to cheat anymore, so it was not surprising that the detective did not have recent evidence. However, one of the things Nadia had me bring was Mari's old cell phone from a drawer at home. The detective was able to access nearly every app, as if he were using her destroyed phone. He found nude photos sent and received from various men, as well as numerous messages and sexts with enough evidence of guilt to sway any judge. Nadia asked if I wanted to see any of the pictures or read the texts, but I declined. We needed to plan how I was going to confront Mari about Carrie. Nadia suggested doing it in her office if Mari could be convinced to come. She called Mari's mother's cell phone in front of me and I heard Mari's voice for the first time since I left the hospital. Nadia got straight to the point and told her that she needed to meet with me to explain a few things. My ex declared that she had been waiting and wanting to talk. She was asked if her lawyer could be contacted, to which Mari replied that she did not have one but was willing to come the next afternoon to talk. It was all I could do to get through the next day without crying like a lunatic at work while pretending to be productive. I could barely keep my lunch down, but I left at three and headed to the firm, feeling nauseous. I arrived first intentionally, wanting her to be forced to enter and sit on the side away from the door, unable to approach me. As I scrolled through pictures of our perfect family that never existed, she came in. She needed assistance walking and was still in two casts from the accident. I didn't have to worry about her trying to hug me. I thought she might be playing it up for sympathy, but we did have a bad accident. I just wanted her to sit down so I could ask her to explain herself. Once we were all seated, water was offered and the meeting began. My lawyer started by asking Mari if she minded us recording the meeting, to which she agreed. As soon as we started recording, my soon-to-be ex-wife began to try and apologize. I bluntly interrupted her and asked her point-blank how many men she had cheated on me with, and when it started. There were enough confirmed hookups from the private investigator to know that the guy I caught her with wasn't the first by a mile. She didn't know what we knew, of course, and I guess her plan was to only admit to what she knew we knew. I asked her again for a rough estimate how many men she had slept with since our son was born. Giving that specific time frame seemed to give her a minute's pause, but she kept trying to act clueless. She still thought it was all a game at that point, and I was losing my cool. Nadia put her hand on my shoulder and gently pushed me back away from the table. She looked at Mari and asked if I was a good father. Mari quickly gave me a glowing review, saying she couldn't ask for a better father to raise her children. I wanted to stand up and flip the table at the way she stared at her children. Nadia then asked her if the other father of her child was going to be a good dad too. As Mari was asking which other father she was talking about, my counsel slid the paternity results for Carrie across the table. As much as I have hated what my life has become since discovering her cheating, I needed to be there to see her reaction in person. She was obviously shocked to know Carrie isn't mine and she tried to hit me with the whole you're her father who has raised her, but I had to shut that down. I asked her who Carrie's father was. She looked down with a hint of shame, and I thought she might be protecting someone. When she said she didn't know for sure who Carrie's father is, Mari saw me truly break down in tears for the first time. I just couldn't take it anymore and lost it. 
Mari was crying but asked to try and explain. She reminded me about the postpartum depression she went through after Michael was born. I did my best to be as sympathetic as I could at the time. I can say with certainty that I spent every moment I could looking after my son so she could have time to herself. There were days when she was so depressed she couldn't even get out of bed, and I took care of all of us. But I loved doing it. I loved doing it for the family I had. I remembered I had actually been foolish enough to think that making it through had made our relationship stronger. But no, she didn't blame it on Rebecca. When she first got Mari to go on a few girls' nights out, I was relieved, if not grateful. They had been best friends for years but hadn't seen much of each other during the pregnancy. Mari said she got really drunk the second time they went out and she let some guy feel her up while she gave him head. She said she felt guilty about it for a while, for months. But she began to resent not being able to be young and free to be with whomever she chose. She told us she started hooking up with guys the nights she would go out with Rebecca. Until the night before our wreck, she had never not come home or come home late over the years. She claimed she didn't want to develop feelings for any of the guys. She also claimed she always used protection and never slept with the same guy more than three times. She said she just wanted sex. I was dumbfounded. Finding out your wife is a filthy lying garden tool tends to do that. It was like learning your life is a reality show you didn't ask to be in. I wanted to yell at her but I was too busy calculating how many men she possibly cheated on me with over a period of years. Nadia asked her if she had any idea who Carrie's father might be, and she swore she always assumed she was mine. My lawyer pointed out that obviously something happened and suggested maybe a condom broke. When my wife confessed that it happened a few times with a few guys, I lost my shit. I asked her who the hell she was because I didn't know the person telling me such horrible things. It was like she was telling me to pass the salt. I asked her when she started hating me and why. I asked what I had ever done to warrant being treated the way she did. How could she do this to her daughter? I raged. She took it, knowing it was all true. After what she just told me and what I expressed about how I feel about her, divorce is a given. What was once a marriage had become scorched earth. The only thing left to do was to tally up the casualties. I've lost a wife and daughter, that's two. A wife lost a husband, that's three. A daughter lost a father, and a brother had his sister become a half-sibling. Then you get into grandparents and in-laws. Mari essentially destroyed two entire families. Her parents will not be okay with what she was doing. And I swear by all that's holy I will let them see all the evidence the PI finds. She admitted to meeting with men from dating apps with Rebecca and using girl time as a time to hook up. She claimed she never meant to hurt me. She swore she had no idea Carrie wasn't mine. I actually believe her because I had no idea either. But DNA doesn't lie. I asked why she didn't just divorce me. She came straight out and said, because she didn't want to lose the security I gave her. Now, she cried, and all of it was said through tears, but I know my expression was just scorn. I was disgusted at the person who sat across from me. I feel defeated. I'm pretty sure one of the reasons she came to talk without a lawyer is due to the fact that I own everything. She doesn't have much to lose outside of a small 401k and my assets that's, that I entered the marriage with by inheriting my grandfather's estate when I was 14. The woman I call mom is not my biological mother. My mother died when I was two from a rare fast spreading cancer. My dad remarried the woman I call mom when I was four. I have known my entire life that she wasn't my biological mother and I wasn't her biological son. I learned later that she couldn't have children and raising me helped her experience that. When my biological mother's dad died, what was left to her went to me as her heir, but I couldn't touch it until I was 21. I studied hard and went to school, but I don't have to work. Fiscally, she knows I will mop the floor with her in the divorce, and she won't be getting anything close to half. She has a job. She isn't able to work at the moment due to her injuries, but she has a job. Part of me wants to punish her, and the other part of me wants to be done with her. Mari was obviously medicated for pain. Maybe that's why she was being so blunt. 
but her words just cut me deep as my imagination made them even worse. I asked if she felt any shame. She claimed she did. I asked how the hell we were going to find out who Carrie's father actually is. My soon-to-be ex-wife started in with, I already know who her father is. Bias. I was not in the mood for some philosophical discussion about what constitutes being a father. Whomever Carrie's father actually is deserves to know, and she needs to know about his family for health reasons. The evidence the PI had found didn't stretch back to before Carrie was born. I asked her if she could find any of these men or had saved their numbers. She had the audacity to say that the point of losing their numbers was to never see them again. My god, how did I not see that logic? I told her she might have wanted to keep his number to let him know he had a child on the way, or she got an STD. I want my name off of Carrie's birth certificate. DNA proves she is her mother's child and not mine. As stated, I will support her financially on my own free will long past her turning 18. She will not want for anything. As for my son in custody, I'm truly not sure what to do. Before the paternity test, I was strongly going for a 90-10 arrangement, giving my ex-wife custody one weekend a month and certain holidays. Now that Carrie is not mine, I don't feel right about pursuing custody. For her, even if I could get it. As Michael is, in fact, her brother, albeit half, I don't want to take him from her too. I don't want either of them to suffer. But I haven't seen Carrie since the test results, and... I can't let her see me break down because of them. God knows how much her therapy is going to cost me, but I will have to pay for it. There's no way to know if her real dad can afford it, and my own therapy will be enough to pay for some shrink's new beach house. Driving home after the meeting, a huge part of me just wanted to end it all. It seemed like the most beneficial solution for everyone but me. Both families could go on pretending about paternity. My ex could sleep around openly while spending my grandfather's money, and the kids wouldn't have to deal with any broken marriage or failed relationships. But by the time I got home I said F that. Nadia is drawing up divorce papers and legal paperwork to have me declared not Carrie's father. That will make things take much longer, but I do not want any legal grounds that can force me to interact, pay for, or deal with offspring that are not mine. The legal team is doing research for ways to find out who Carrie's father is. Many of the ancestry sites suggest potential relatives when results come back. Right now, that's our first plan of action. Even if the results don't come back pointing to a certain individual, they might point to a brother, cousin, or another relative. Whomever the guy is, he may not be ready to accept a child he didn't know about. It could cause some anxiety in his life. But I doubt it will be nearly the terror I felt losing my daughter forever because she never existed. Everything is just so screwed up at the moment. Nothing is stable. Chaos is a daily burden at this point. The kids come back to the house on Sunday afternoon. I've never wanted to not see them before. But I know many inevitabilities will happen that I cannot be prepared for. When she sees me and wants to hug her daddy, I'm not even sure how I'll react. Hug her and cry like a baby, knowing she has never truly been mine. Tell her I'm not the person she's looking for. I don't have it in me to be mean to her. But my heart is broken. Like, there is nobody to take this out on, even Mari. Because nothing I could do outside of murder would equal the betrayal she has done to me. That scale will never be balanced. She used me and spit me out. She deserves to rot in hell for her promiscuous lying ways. I'm destroyed and everything I used to love is too. I will win the divorce. Nadia and company will make it the most lopsided division of assets in the history of divorce. But Mari reduced or removed the value of so much for me. It feels like she's already won again. To hell with her. I'm left with a son she will try to use against me and manipulate. Some people are just so horrible. They deserve to be put down like an animal. I made the stupid decision to have a child with one, but now I know I'm not the only stupid one.